This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. Episode 48? Yep. A bit of a combo to kick off. Listener question and bad advice of the week, which was pretty interesting. Yeah, it was interesting. And then a couple other topics. One is on the huge shift in the industry in the U.S. in terms of fund flows into index funds and uh, out of active mutual funds. Yep. And things are nearly as scary as we thought, or some think. Yep. Before we get on into, the, into the episode, I do just want to say that we know we've gotten a handful of new listeners recently, just based on the number of downloads that have been happening, and we, we appreciate everyone that's listening. And we appreciate everyone that's sending in questions and comments. It really helps us prepare for each show. We've also gotten a couple of really nice new reviews on iTunes, which, uh, yeah, we always appreciate getting those. And also a two-star rating. We did get our first two-star first rating. two-star rating. No, no associated comments, so we don't know why. Fair enough. That's fine. That's fine. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll get into the episode. All right. Welcome to episode 48 of The Rational Reminder. So off the top, we get some very technical information to get from Ben, who with his kids has become a bit of a an expert in monster trucks, or what do you call them? Oh, well, it's R- RC, remote controlled vehicles. I- I'm not an expert though. Yeah, but you mentioned 7,000 kilowatt or whatever it is. KV. KV. See, I- I'm not an expert. Th- thousands of RPMs per volt applied to the to the motor. We got a very fast motor for our remote controlled monster truck. The thing's terrifying. It probably goes 75 miles per hour. <laughs> And your your kids are how old? Well, they don't drive it on full speed. You can you can you put a limiter on it. Yeah, there's a limiter on it. Must be hilarious to see when it goes full speed. It's honestly terrifying. <laughs> I don't think I've ever made it go full speed. It's kind of like me and my drone taking that off was absolutely terrifying. Yeah, you can kill someone with it. Yeah, and I have to get my license for the drone by June first. Wow, yeah. yeah, taking it up a notch. So you I should to... take the drone out one day and film the RC cars. Yeah, that'll be kind of cool. Before you get the, before you have the license requirement, we got a couple of days, right? June 1st. I better get on that course. Anyways, so this is our episode. So we're going to do a kind of a combo to kick it off, which is a current topic slash bad advice of the week. Should we comment on the uh, downloads? We, we, we mentioned last, last time we had our own episode that the, we were almost going to hit 10,000 downloads that month and we ended up falling short last month, but we're already at. 12? 12 or 13,000. I mean, largely, I think, I mean, it's organic growth. We know that, but I, I'm thinking that some must have come from your video because your video went viral last week. Yeah. I'll actually talk about that topic, the 5% rule, but you were up to what, 450,000 downloads? It was 420 or something like that. Unreal. And that now was kind of neat. 22,000, 23,000 subscribers, I think, to your YouTube channel. Yeah. There, there was a lot of, a lot of growth on the YouTube channel. And I, I agree. Some of it probably translated over to the podcast too. But now we're about 2,500 downloads per week on the podcast, which is nice. Awesome. So you got a listener question last week. I did get a listener question. And I actually wanted to just comment on on listener questions, which I've been getting a lot of. And I always say how much I love it, and I do. But I mean, my LinkedIn, Twitter, email, they're all backlogged with questions from people. So if I haven't answered you, I, I will. It's just uh, there, there, there are a lot of them right now. Or email me. You seem to get them all. That's true. You can email a Cameron too. Yeah. So someone, someone emailed me uh, saying that they listened to the burn your mortgage podcast, which I, I, I'm aware of, but I don't, I don't actually listen to it. The guest that, that they had on, on the podcast that our, our listener wanted us to comment on was talking about using dividend stocks to pay down your mortgage quickly. But the, the, the guest had a lot of very strong opinions on dividend investing, but also on index investing. So I listened to the episode because I want, you know, I wanted to the, 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 our listener asked us to comment on it. So I figured I'd give it a listen and see if there were any comments to make. And there were. A lot of passion though. I will give the, the, the commentator that you can tell that he really loves dividend investing and which is our main point all the time. And I do want to throw out there before we get started on this, that I don't want to, uh, we don't want to mean to anyone. That's not our, that's not our goal. And we we're fully aware of what it takes and how it feels to put your ideas and thoughts out there for everybody to listen to. But anyway, so into our commentary. So one of the things that the guest on this episode said was that, and again, I don't want to be mean, but this, this is completely absurd. <laughs> they said that once you collect enough dividends from a stock, you've eliminated your risk. So you're, you don't have any more risk or it's at least dramatically reduced. Because you've gotten all your money back. So you put, your, you put some money into the stock, but once you've collected that amount or more back from dividends, you now don't care about the price. There's, there's no risk anymore. Right. Was the comment. 
we always have to think about markets from the from a framework. And if we're thinking about them from the framework that markets are efficient, even not that's not even not, not even market efficiency. When a company pays a dividend, <laughs> the capital is reduced by the amount of the dividend. That's not even efficient markets. Efficient markets is just that being reflected in the price. But it is a fact that when a dividend is paid, the value of the company decreases by the amount. That's a fact, regardless of market efficiency, whatever. Yeah. Many of your followers will disagree, but it is a fact. No, they're not. I wouldn't call the dividend crowd my followers. I was being polite. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, if we reframe it in that context, think about a stock that doesn't pay a dividend. If you put some amount into a stock and then every time it increases, you shave off some of the capital. Once you've been able to shave off enough capital that you've recouped your initial investment, it doesn't mean you're not taking risk anymore. Of course not. You have that capital still in the stock. Well, you maybe took it out and put it in cash, but there's still an economic risk to holding cash. Like what are you doing with the dividends? But even still, the capital portion of the stock, that is that, that's still risky. The idea that you can hold dividend hold a dividend stock, collect dividends, and then you're no longer taking price risk doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. Total return is the only thing that matters to an investor. Then he gave an example of taking the dividends to pay off your mortgage and you could in his example pay off your mortgage 5 years faster and who wouldn't want that? Well, of course, you're just taking basically money out of the portfolio and putting it towards your mortgage. It doesn't matter if it came from dividends. It's money as money. You could do that. Yep. People do that, but it doesn't have to come from dividends. And then I got a kick out of the 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 host of the show asked about, well, what do you think about index funds? Because I have some index funds. And he said, well, index funds are getting a lot of publicity and it is better than leaving the money under your mattress. So it's nice to know that our belief system is better than having your money under a mattress and 50 years of modern portfolio theory is better than money under your mattress. 60 years. 60 years. Anyway, so he went through a bunch of issues that he has with four, index not, funds. Four, not a bunch. He had very specific well, four. Th these are my four issues with index funds. Yeah, number one he described is that, well, not, he, he prefers to buy stocks that are undervalued because clearly that's not hard to do. A little bit of education, you learn how to buy undervalued stocks. You, you are unable to do that with an index fund. You buy the S&P 500, you have to buy the ones that are overvalued as well as the ones that are undervalued. And just for some context, the, the, the guest on, on this uh, podcast was talking about how he uses the current dividend yield of a stock compared to its average dividend yield historically. And that's how he identifies an undervalued stock. It's also why he said he didn't like drip programs because he'd rather have the drips paid in cash. We can use the, the dividends to buy the undervalued shares. I don't want to reinvest in a company whose share price has gone up with that dividend. So that's why he's opposed to drips. Right. So the four issues with index funds, you just mentioned one, you're buying stocks that are overvalued and undervalued. Now, of course, in an efficient market, there are no under or overvaluations. So that's not something that we would agree with, obviously. Uh, and then out of the five, the 500 stocks in the index, not all of them pay dividends. So you're just relying on the price to go up. Can you imagine the horror? No dividends. Yep. Can't, can't even imagine it. It really, it really blows my mind that any, anyway, dividends. <laughs> it's like I said in my video on dividends, dividends don't matter. And when we're talking about the total returns of the market, dividends do matter because if you take them out, you're not accounting for those distributions of capital over time. And as I said earlier, it's his passion around this. I believe that's leading him to become probably a good investor because he loves it so much. I'm sure he's saving money to put into more dividend paying stocks. And when he talked about his strategy, he's buying value stocks that are profitable, which are to be completely fair. Those are two of the factors that do drive returns. Yep. Now, when you're picking a handful of stocks, you're not that likely to actually get the expected outcome. Yep but still still better than picking random stocks and getting in and out of the market at the worst possible times. So I think we picked off a bunch of his issues. I think we picked off the four. Well, just, let's, no. Are you want to go through them one by one? Well, we've already gotten through most of them. Oh, so he also said that he wants to invest in companies that are recession proof. And with the S&P 500, you're getting some companies that are and some companies that aren't. Recession proof isn't a thing, by the way. There are defensive companies like low beta companies which we talked about in a previous episode, yeah. but there's no such thing as recession proof. There are companies that will go bust in a recession, regardless of their business model, which you can't predict. Yeah. But the last one was probably my favorite of, of all of them was that you're still paying fees with an index fund. And especially as you get into larger dollar amounts, the fees on index funds start to become very impactful. That's true. But when you trade off the five basis points, you're going to pay for an index fund, 10, whatever it is, with the lack of diversification from owning individual stocks, there's, there's no... There's no comparison. Yeah. And the last comment he had about index funds was a lot of index funds, he says, reinvest dividends. You don't actually see the dividends, which isn't good. It's better to see the dividend being paid into your brokerage account. Right. Which was not like when we're talking about ETFs, I don't think that they do that. 
right? ETFs big, are going to you're cash. going to get cash distribution. These are index funds. So index funds like the TD index series mutual will, funds will reinvest the dividend, of course. But you can opt for that or you not. You can opt to have it paid in cash if you like. Anyways, the best thing to do is to start educating yourself and then leads to learning how to identify undervalued companies. That's and his it's, his it's, his it's his really advice. quite easy. It's also his business to teach that. Yeah, you're being facetious obviously. It is scary that there is uh, there are providers of information out there who are effectively spreading misinformation. Like there is an understanding of how financial markets work in the academic literature, which applied directly to, I was talking to somebody about this actually on the weekend, someone who is, they, they are an academic or they come from academia, they now work in uh, technology, but they, they were talking about how people in industry will often say, oh, well, the academic research, like you can't, you can't apply that in, the, in real life. And he was like, what do you think the researchers are basing their research on? Like, do you think they're just making up numbers? Yeah. And you've had that comment a lot in your comments on YouTube. Research is done based on real world implementation, right. real world results. That is what is being researched. Anyway, so there's this understanding of how markets work and there's this research body of research, yet there are people out there like this person here. And like a lot of the people who answered that Globe Mail article in the comments who are literally spreading information that is wrong based on our understanding of financial markets. They're telling a great story. And a lot of them are selling it like, uh, like this guy. So you want to move on to another current topic, things that are going right? Yeah, this one's fascinating. The, in the US, and this is not true in Canada, and we'll talk about that more in a sec, I guess. But in the US, index funds and active funds have reached parity in terms of assets. In terms of fund flows. In terms of assets. And fund flows, I believe. Fund flows have been, well, the opposite. Yeah, you're correct. Yes. So f fund flows are massively going from active funds into passive funds. Yeah. They've reached, uh, yeah. it's, it's anti pair, whatever you would call yeah. that. It's they're, the they're inverse inverse. Correct. Yeah. That's, that's what I meant. So funds are leaving. There's a massive shift in the U S marketplace. So there, well, that, the, the big story is that they are now in terms of fund assets, they're half index and half active, which, which is a big deal in Canada for fund assets. We're still 90% active. But one of the takeaways is that not a huge part of the market is actually in managed money. That's the chart that really got me. When you look at how much of the marketplace in the US is still, because the question comes up a lot. Well, if everyone indexed, what's going to happen with price discovery? Yeah. So we're talking about a couple of different charts here. So the Morningstar had their asset flows report, and that's where the story of the amount of assets in passive, that's where that came from, yeah. from Morningstar's fund flow commentary for US funds. But then we've got a couple other charts here that we're looking at, and we are going to post, we are going to post these on, we have a website. People might not know that because this is a podcast. People probably find it on iTunes and stuff, but we have a website called rationalreminder.ca where we do post all the episodes and we will post the charts that we're talking about today on that website, rationalreminder.ca if you want to. But the cumulative fund flow chart is something showing since the great, what, since 2009, so just after the global financial crisis, $1.5 trillion of funds has gone from active over to passive. It's amazing. So that, that's one story, but then within this whole concept of now it's an equal split between active and passive. The other chart that you were talking about came from a different report from the Investment Company Institute. So that's again, looking at US, US fund assets, well, US assets in general. And the way that that relates to the story that we're talking about now is that even though, even though fund assets are now equally split between active and passive, total assets, like when you look at total US market capitalization, it's still over 70% not in funds. So that security is held directly or held by institutions or whatever it is. Pensions or. But not in funds. So when you look at the overall market cap weight of index funds, it's probably closer. Well, for the investment company institute, it was end of 2018. And at that time it was 13%. So 13% of the US market cap is in index funds. So that means price discovery is being done by 87%. Well, yeah. And I mean, there, there's more data on that, 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 uh, that I wanted to talk about as well. There was a study from Vanguard in 2018 and they showed that in terms of trading activity, index funds make up 5%. Because the turnover is probably a lot less. Well, they said a lot of the, a lot of the transactions in index funds are happening on the secondary market. So oh, it's really? not, it's not index funds going and buying securities directly. It's people who already own index funds units trading them with each other. So there's no, there's no primary market that there's no e ETFs aren't going and buying and selling stocks most of the time. It's people buying and selling ETF units from each other, which does not result in creation or redemption. Fascinating. Yeah. So, and this was done in 2018 when index funds were still not quite 50%, but, but a very large proportion of 
fund assets. It's amazing. 5% of the market's trading activity is done by index funds. I mean, it's nowhere near a problem. But I think that the the concern, like when you see, oh, well, 50% of the market of, of the fund assets, which people initially think about as the market, yeah. which we just debunked, but say it is 50% of the market, of the overall market. The thing people start to worry about is price discovery, like you mentioned a right. second ago. And price discovery just means like if if no one is doing the research on individual companies and actively investing, then how can market prices be correct in the first place? But it's really 50% of the 30% of the marketplace. Right. So it's not even close to being an issue, but say it, say it was. Yeah. Say, say we were closer and, and it was a real concern. Th- this all ties into something called the Grossman-Stiglitz paradox, which a couple of guys named Grossman and Stiglitz wrote about in their 1980 paper. And you did a YouTube on it with- That was a while ago, yeah. Plain Bagel. Oh yeah, Plain Bagel, yeah. That's right. So they basically said that if, if markets are efficient, then you can't beat the market consistently. And in that world, indexing is the smartest way to invest, but markets can only be efficient if there are enough people trying to beat the market. So that creates a paradox because if, if markets are efficient, no one's going to be active, but if no one's active, markets can't be efficient. Right. So I think in practice, it ends up being more like an equilibrium than a paradox where if it really did happen that too many people started to index and there was not enough price discovery, that would create ability, uh, an opportunity for active managers to exploit. And as soon as they exploited it and made profits, everybody else would rush back in active. So that's always going to be, I think should be at least self, self-correcting. self But knowing the number of people and the number of companies that we do know, I mean, you just can't even imagine the world going that far. Yeah, you can't. I agree. Fama and French looked at this in a 2005 paper and they talked about at what point would prices be, could prices no longer be set by the market? Like how much indexing would it take? I and mean, their commentary was that if, if the misinformed and uninformed, like the bad active managers turned passive, then market efficiency will actually improve so as the unskilled or, or right. l- lucky and then unlucky active managers leave because they're no longer successful, if the remaining active managers are truly the, the really skilled good ones, markets are actually going to be more efficient because there are less bad active managers to exploit. And then they also said that even, even if an active manager with good information or a skilled active manager turns passive, the effect could be negligible as long as there are still enough skilled active managers competing with each other. But that kind of ties back into my comment where as long as there are, or if there are at some point opportunities to exploit and there are some skilled active managers to exploit them, well, I guess that, that creates opportunities if too many people index, which makes maybe more active managers rush in, yep. which takes away the opportunities. Yep. And that cycle should always continue going no matter how big indexing gets. Keeping in mind that indexing is still tiny relative to overall US market cap. And that's in the US where... They have, they are, they are at parity for fund assets, but I mentioned in Canada, we're still 90% nowhere near active. Nowhere near like the U S. So I wouldn't say that this is something to be concerned about. I think it's, it's generally a good thing because people in the U S anyway are saving a ton of money on fees, but not, uh, not at this point anyway, something to be worried about in terms of market efficiency. So we've had a question quite a bit lately, and this is our portfolio management topic of the week. So we had a few new people come through with assets and the question we've had, I think two or three times just this past week alone is the markets are high. Shouldn't we just be holding our investments as cash for now until there's a correction that we buy in then, which certainly has an appeal. Sounds easy enough. Sounds almost like it's predictable, some sort of mean reversion. And I thought the answer you gave in one of our meetings this week was a good one, which I thought you may want to touch on the fact that there have been studies on this in the past, but there's not enough reliable data to be able to persistently time when to get into the market. Kind of. There is enough data and it's 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 a little bit more nuanced. I think that there's, there's studies that have shown a relationship between prices and future returns. So when prices are high, like they are now, future returns tend to be lower. And that's true. Like that is a fact. But they're mainly high in the U.S., given the run we've had in the U.S. market for the past decade. Yeah. Not necessarily high around the world, not necessarily high in different- But say they were high. Say they were high everywhere. When, when you look at the data on that, that relationship is pretty strong. But AQR did a paper on this a while ago. And their comment, which was really interesting, is that you, you can look at that data and you can see the relationship. But when people look at that data, they usually look at the full data set and sort stocks by their relative price based on the full data set. When you're sorting by the full data set, you're cheating in terms of modeling an actual investment decision because us today, we don't have the full data set from now until the future. We only have the data set from now into the past. Right. 
And so AQR showed the clearly like monotonic relationship between price and future returns where high prices equal lower returns, low prices equal higher returns in the future. They, they showed that very clearly, but then they redid that example using only, so for each period that they reconstituted their expensive and cheap quintiles, they used quintiles in their study for each, for each period, they uh, only used the historical data. So they didn't use any future data to do their sort, only historical data. And the relationship between future returns and price weakened. You could still see that there was a relationship on the chart, but it, it definitely weakened. And then in the same paper, what they did is they said, okay, well, let's build a, let's build a market timing strategy using this information. So we know that when prices are high, future returns tend to be low. So let's build a strategy and, and try and exploit it. So they did that in, in the paper, not a, not a real portfolio, but they did, they did that in the paper. So using the historical data sort. So at each point in time, they over or underweight stocks. Based on recent performance. Based on the current price Schiller Cape relative to the past. Okay. So it's based on the metrics from Schiller Cape, not based on recent performance. Oh yeah, no, this is all Schiller Cape. Yeah. So that's, we didn't even talk about that, but Schiller Cape in, and Vanguard did a paper on this a while ago. Schiller Cape is by far the most reliable metric for forecasting future returns. So when we're talking about prices being high, people are generally talking about Schiller Cape. Okay. And that's the cyclically adjusted price earnings. So anyway, where was I there? So okay, so they did this study. They built model portfolios based on the Schiller Cape. Right. So in their market timing strategy, they found that over the full period from 1900 through 2015, it added value. So you're better off using their market timing strategy over that full period than you were just holding the market. So that's a pretty interesting finding. There but, must be a butt coming. Yeah, there is. <laughs> so there's they, always a butt. So they they then found that from 1958 through 2015, for that period specifically, the strategy underperformed. No way. Just holding the market. So 1900 through 1957, it outperformed enough that over the full period you outperformed. Why would that be? Yeah. So this is kind of the at least in my from when I read the paper, what I took away as the main the main point was that over very long periods of time prices can look cheap or expensive relative to the past. So you can have 50 years or well, 60 in the case of 1958 through 2015, you can have th these huge number of years of, of decades where prices for the full period are high relative to the past. So from 1958 through basically now, prices have been high and increasingly high relative to the past. So if you're doing a market timing strategy based on Schiller Cape, you were, as, as in the paper, their strategy was, underinvested for the whole you're time. you're always looking high all the way through that era. That's right. So their main takeaway was that you you can't, with, without, without the ability to predict the future, without the ability to see what valuations are going to be in the future, you cannot say prices are high. You can say prices are high relative to the past. You cannot say that prices are high objectively today. Going forward. You can't say it's high today because we don't know what future valuations are going to be. And without that information, there's no way to say prices are high. Prices are high relative to the past. Yeah, I wonder what the driver is. Is it the falling interest rates over the past 30 years? I'm not an Which, economist. I don't know. Just to try to, or is it technology is giving more information to more people, people becoming more, more market participants willing to take on the risk with well, Larry, the great democratization of markets. Larry Swedger did a post a while ago, just talking about how the, the Schiller Cape needs context. And I, I should have, I should have read that post for, for our conversation today. I didn't, but th there were a bunch of reasons that Larry gave, some of them being increased liquidity, which decreases risk, yep. but there were also some accounting changes. So there were a bunch of reasons that Larry gave for why it's reasonable for prices to be higher today relative to the past. So that's a whole other topic. Like is Schiller Cape the right metric to use still based on these changes that Larry Swedger was talking about? Maybe, maybe not. But even if it is, the AQR paper is saying that without without the ability to know what future valuations are going to be, we cannot make investment right. decisions today based on the current price earnings. So a lot of people that have the cash will often ask us, well, can we average into the marketplace? So let's say you have $100,000, you could do $10,000 a month for 10 months. But of course, once you're fully invested, you've got the same risk exposure as if you invested today. So you kind of ease in to avoid regret for perhaps those 10 months. But once you're in, you're in. When I have this conversation with people, I always just, I, I use the, the Vanguard study as a talking point because they looked at this. They looked at what if you dollar cost averaged as opposed to doing a lump sum. And they looked at, I think, uh, US, UK, uh, Australia, maybe. They looked at three different markets and they did dollar cost averaging versus lump sum over 
I believe it was 10 year horizons. I, I believe, don't quote me on that though, but they tested these, these two lump sum versus dollar cost averaging in these different markets over the full data set that they had available at the time. And they found that in about two thirds of their sample trials, a uh, lump sum beat dollar cost averaging. Right. And that's generally because markets tend to be increasing about two thirds of the time. So anyway, the, the way that I explain this to people is that the statistically optimal decision, regardless of what the world looks like or what prices are or whatever, the statistically optimal decision is to invest in a lump sum. That's where your expected returns are the highest. And that's what's been statistically optimal in the past. But if that makes you feel nervous, then dollar cost averaging is is a perfectly fine alternative, much better than trying to get the perfect time. There's also, you know, cost of scars. So I've talked to people who did invest, for example, right in the uh, beginning of 2008, and they temporarily have the market hit them and values drop and they're scarred for life on that. I'll never do that again. I think that there's some other, a couple other data points that are interesting on this topic. The there's one from 1977 through 2018, the S&P TSX returned 9.72%. But if you missed the 15 best trading days, your annualized return drops to 7.44%. So that's 15 of all the trading days from 1977 through 2018. You missed the 15 best and your annualized return drops to 7.44%. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. But it just speaks to the importance of being in the market if you want to get the market's returns. The counter argument is if you miss the 15 worst days, you would have had a better return too. Yeah, it's true. And it's probably just as hard to find the, miss the best days it is to. Well, so many people say, well, I'll, I'll buy back in when things look better. Well, when things look better, prices will probably be higher. Like what signals will you be using to decide when to buy back in? I did a blog post in 2015 that I should probably update. But anyway, I looked at what if you had lump sums, I think it was like $1.5 million to start. And you did $500,000 on March 1st, 2000, right before the tech crash. $500,000 on June 1st, 2007, right before the financial crisis, and $500,000 on July 1st, 2011, which we had a relatively small dip, but still still a little dip. And by the end of 2015, when I was writing the post, the portfolio, which in my perfect hindsight had been invested at the worst possible times, it had a money-weighted return of 5.82% per year, which isn't bad. For the worst possible time to buy in. That was the worst, but you, you couldn't have had worse times to invest. And that's over a 15 year period. And actually because largely because US stocks weren't so great for that full decade from 2000 through 2010, this portfolio that I was hypothetically investing, it was a global portfolio. And that 5.82% return money weighted, including investing at the worst possible times actually beat the S and P 500, uh, in term in time weighted return because just because US stocks didn't do well over that time period. So I guess that speaks to the importance of diversification. Well, it actually probably speaks to the importance of small cap and value as well. And giving it a proper time horizon. And giving it a proper time horizon, yeah. That's actually, the small cap and value thing is interesting because in the US market, over that time period, 2000 through 2010, US market was flat. US small cap and value actually had great returns. Absolutely. So that, that's an important context. My global portfolio that was invested at the worst possible times was global and tilted towards small cap and value. And it smoked the S&P 500 despite being invested at the worst possible times. On to the planning topic, talk a bit about the uh, the subject that your recent YouTube video went viral on. I thought it was really interesting how you framed the decision between should I rent or should I buy? So many people don't have the proper framework around that and don't capture all the cost. Little anecdote as someone who has a house out of nowhere, I had a $2,500 cost hit me when I had a, as you know, a raccoon move into my attic. So it's one of those examples where, I mean, all of us own a house, put so much money into things like that, but that came out of nowhere, a $2,500 cost. Yeah. That never ends up in a spreadsheet anywhere to find out, did you make money on your house or not? It, it doesn't end, no. I think that's when, like, this is sort of related, but not not exactly the topic that we're talking about here. But when people evaluate how, how have they done in their house, you know what you paid for it. You know what it's worth when you sell it. And that number is often pretty attractive, but that never takes into account the cost of property taxes, the cost of maintenance costs over time. And if you factor those things in, your returns would be much lower. But people don't evaluate their real estate returns based on that. They say, how much did I pay? How much is it worth now? Well, I listened to a podcast this morning with Tim Ferriss interviewed. I can't remember his name. Phenomenal interview. Guy from New York City who does financial advice. And talked about how if you're going to be in a house less than seven to 10 years, just the cost of acquisition and that, you know, real estate fees on the sell side, unless you're committed for seven to 10 years, in his opinion, it makes no sense at all. I say the same thing. I say 10 years. 
Uh, anyway, so the, 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 I think the reason that this video blew up was that, because I've covered this topic before twice in past YouTube videos and they're, they've done okay over time, but nothing like this one. And I think that the, the real hook was that I, I made this, I, I made a very, very simple decision tool to think about the housing decision. And I just said that if you, if you take 5% of the value of the home that you're looking at, so 5% of the value divided by 12 to get a monthly number, if you can rent for that amount or less then renting is financially an equivalent decision. And it's useful. Like I, we, we just rented a, a new house, signed a three-year lease. But in, in doing that, I, I actually used this decision tool. I, I thought, okay, what is for the amount of rent that I'm paying times 12 divided by 5%. And that gives you the equivalent value of the home that I, I am taking on the costs of something equivalent to this price of home. And that was useful. It's like, okay, I, I know what I'm getting. I know what I'm getting myself into from a financial perspective. So what did your ratio come out to be? Well, it's 5%. All right, I haven't said that yet. Okay. Have I not? Yeah, it's the, the 5% rule. That was the whole, so that was your, the whole thing. So your ex example was 5%. Like your rent is 5% of the house well, value. I, I don't know what the house value is. I'm just saying okay. you, can, you can use the 5% rule to figure out what the equivalent value of a home is in terms of the unrecoverable costs. So we should probably talk, like I, we haven't even dug into what this is about. So the- the whole point of this 5% rule thing is that you have as a, as a homeowner, you have unrecoverable costs and rent, rent is like a super easy unrecoverable cost to understand because you pay rent, the money goes away and the money's get, gone. But when you own a home, you also have three main sources of unrecoverable costs. You have property taxes, which not are roughly 1%. Yep. You have maintenance costs, which I, I say 1%. I've had homeowners oh, tell it's me all it's, of that. it's all of that. Yeah. Absolutely. I can tell you unequivocally, it is all of that. Yeah. People often tell me that 1% is too low. When you take into account all the stuff that happens, the painting to the roof, to the hot water tank, depends on the age of the house. But in the past few years, I've had AC, furnace, roof, raccoon, painting. Like it, seriously, it doesn't stop. But most people don't account for that. Don't think about that. Well, that's, so I agree. And then the last one that people really don't think about is, is the cost of capital. And that's the biggest one. So 5%, 1% property tax, 1% maintenance costs. And then 3% is what I'm using for my cost of capital estimate. And what that's based on is when you have debt, you've got a 3% interest cost, but when you have equity, and this is the real big one, because people think when I've paid off my home, I don't have any more housing costs. It's wrong. The, a mortgage payment is not your housing cost. No. A mortgage payment is a mix of interest costs and savings. But once you have, say you've got a $500,000 home that's, that's completely paid for, that's $500,000 that you could be using for something else, like for example, investing in stocks. And if we assume a 6% return on stocks, nominal return, 3% nominal return on real estate, which is in line with what real estate's done globally over the last 120 years, that's a 3% opportunity cost. So you've got money in a house earning an expected return of 3%. Well, it could be in stocks earning an expected return of 6%. 6%. That's a 3% economic cost. And even though you don't see that coming out of your bank account, that is a real economic cost that you are taking on as a homeowner. So property tax, maintenance cost, cost of capital, 5%. That's kind of it. Some of the comments in the, there were like thousands of comments on that video, but one of them that came up quite a bit, to be clear, the 5% rule is a major oversimplification. There are a lot of other things that go into it, some of which I'm going to talk about right, right now. But one of the comments that came up to the top a lot was um, that with leverage, if you put down $100,000 to buy a $500,000 home and then you get a mortgage, yes, you've got a 3% interest cost, but you've also got, you're, you're getting the 3% expected return on the real estate on way more money than you actually had because yeah. you're putting down $100,000, but you've got a $500,000 asset. You're amplifying the returns. You're amplifying the returns. Now that goes both ways. Obviously leverage is not a risk-free way yep. to increase your returns. But the other big one, and this is where I'm going to have to do another video to go into the, the details of the numbers, but because the mortgage creates a cash flow cost, the owner ends up with, from a cash flow perspective, mortgage payments, which is not all a cost, that's a cash flow expense because only the interest is a cost. A portion of the mortgage payment is a principal repayment. Which is creating equity. Which is creating equity. But from a cash flow perspective, we have a mortgage payment, we have property taxes, we have maintenance costs, which we can estimate as a cash flow cost of 1% per year. And then one of the other ones that isn't in the, the 5% rule, well, it's not in my explanation in the video, but it, it is baked in the rule, is property home insurance. So for a home, like how much do you pay for home insurance? It's like a thousand bucks a year. And so it's uh, much, much cheaper for renter's insurance. Yeah. Much, much cheaper. So those are all costs that go into the 
to go into it, but to kind of verify the simple rule, I used my old rent versus buy model, which I have built in Excel and modeled a $500,000 home with 20% down and 10%, uh, sorry, $10,000 in closing costs. I used a 25 year mortgage, 3% mortgage interest, 1% property tax, 1% maintenance, like we've been talking about. I used 150 per month in home insurance uh, and a 3% nominal real estate growth rate. So the monthly mortgage payment with the $400,000 mortgage, 3%, 25 year, all that stuff is $1,893. But the total cash flow expenses are closer to 35,000 for all those different things that we just yep. talked about. Yep. So to own that $500,000 home, you've got $35,000 a year in cash flow costs. And then the renter, if we're comparing side by side, the renter could have taken that down payment and those closing costs, $110,000 and invest them in stocks. Now, one of the big things here is taxes. If we're assuming a 6% return, that's a 6% pre-tax return. So if our, if our renter here has RSP and TFSA room, the 6% is probably going to be 6%. Well, it's 6% pre-tax, 6% after tax. However, if they're investing in a taxable account and their tax at the highest marginal rate, 6% might be like 4.5%. Yep. So that does affect the 5% rule. And the 5% rule was based on a tax-free investor. Another interesting, well, we've talked about this in the podcast before, your, the cost of owning a home increases if you have RSP room and, T- and TFSA room available. Right. Because your cost of capital is higher. Your cost of equity capital is higher when you have tax-free room. So anyway, the, the renter has $110,000 to invest. Say it's in a tax-free account. They earn 6% on stocks. They pay $2,083 per month in rent, which is 5% to $500,000. And we assume rent increases. This is another thing that came up in the comments of the video is that I didn't take into account rent inflation, but I, it is in there. So we assume rent increases at inflation with 1.7%. And so their, their renter's total cash cost is $25,000 in the first year, going up a bit each year, just like the homeowner, homeowners is going up a bit each year as well. So the big assumption though, the biggest assumption is that the renter is taking that difference in cash flow costs and investing it in a portfolio. Behavior. Yeah. So that's when we're talking about rent versus buy, I think that the single biggest factor is if you cannot be a disciplined saver, you should buy because it forces you to save. 100%. You're not going to miss that mortgage payment. Much like being in a defined benefit plan yep. you're, or defined contribution for that matter, yep. you're forced to put money away. So anyway, if, if the renter does take that $10,000 difference per year, which increasing a little bit each year and invest it into their portfolio, now, assuming it's still a tax-free portfolio, which isn't unreasonable if they've got enough income to create RSP room plus TFSA, yeah, you, could, you could keep investing that amount on a tax-free basis. But under those assumptions, we end up with a home and a portfolio with nearly identical values. So I guess the reason for going through that was a, it was like a verification of the 5% rule, taking into account some of the other variables that I didn't talk about in the, in the video. But in general, you can, you can do this. You can take 5% of the value of a home if you're considering buying and estimate that your total unrecoverable costs are going to be, yeah, 5%. I guess it also helps you too if you want to invest in properties from an investment standpoint as a rental property. If you can get more than 5% as rental income, maybe that means the housing market's undervalued, maybe. This, this is true for the rental market too. So if you're a renter on the other side of that equation, you can, like the house that I'm renting now, based on my 5% calculation, is a great deal which means that it's the rent is underpriced. The house is worth more than- Because your rent is nowhere near the 5% or is below the 5% of the value. Correct. To buy this house would cost much more than my estimate of the value based on the 5%. And I think I, I would love to study this or to see someone study this, but I, I think that landlords, I don't know if this is true globally, but landlords, at least anecdotally, will underprice or even take losses on rentals because they have capital appreciation expectations that are unrealistic. Like when you look at the global returns on real estate going back as far as we have data, they've outpaced inflation by 1.3% on average. So that's, if, if we're assuming 1.7% inflation, that's 3% nominal return. But landlords will take a net rental yield of zero or even a negative number because they want to have, like you want to buy a condo in Toronto or whatever it is. But you have to have that. That's, that's another thing. When you look at investing in real estate, it's been a really good investment long-term globally but that's been 3% roughly capital, 5% net rental yield. So if you give up that 5% net rental yield, all of a sudden real estate's not so attractive. Because you're doing only for the capital appreciation side. Right. Which I think people have, un- landlords will often have unrealistic expectations for. Now, in my case, it's different because the people that were renting the house from, they left the country because they someone got a job and they're going to be gone for five years. 
So they, they probably didn't have unrealistic expectations yeah. for capital. They just needed someone to live in their house. Yeah. Super interesting model. Love it. Anything else? No, I think that's good for this week. Be back with another guest next week. 